Hello, everyone. We'll give folks a chance to uh, log on and join us. We'll wait a few moments. We'll still wait and give people more time to log on. Welcome, welcome. Okay, and we are going to get started. Hello and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Discovery Institute series. Today's program is The Watershed and You, Understanding Your Impact on Our Water Bodies with Sarah Crothers, Education Director of Schuylkill River Greenway's National Heritage Area. Hi everybody. And Diana Mayer, Education Coordinator of Schuylkill River Greenway's National Heritage Area. Hi, thank you all for coming. Welcome Sarah and Diana. And I'd also love to give a special shout out to Jillian Clemente, who is part of the Schuylkill River Greenways team, and also a former Hawk Mountain Sanctuary education trainee from September 2019, who kind of connected our two organizations for this webinar. So thank you, Jillian. So my name is Jamie Dawson, and I am the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. As you may know, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey. And we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members out there, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for your continued support. It means so much to us. And if you're joining us this evening, and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges. And we are so happy to be able to offer our local and global community a variety of free uh, virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone's aware, today's program is being recorded and the video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, viewers may submit their questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. And we've designated some time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And we are so excited that Sarah and Diana are joining us today to teach us about the Schuylkill River watershed how our actions can protect the environment and how we all can be involved and be citizen scientists to track pollution. And before we go further, I'd like to take some time to share uh, the background experiences of both Sarah and Diana with our audience. Sarah Crothers is the Education Director for Schuylkill River Greenways. She earned a BA in Environmental Studies and Spanish from Albright College in 2015. Sarah joined SRG in 2016 and created the Schuylkill Explorers Environmental Education Program for K through 12 students and the Schuylkill ECO Career Development Program for high school and college students. She manages educational events and volunteer programs focused on the environment, history, recreation, and watershed health. Overseeing a team of over 100 Schuylkill River Trail Ambassadors and co-leading the SRG Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, Sarah enjoys working with community members to promote equity and recreation and the environmental field. Born and raised in Philadelphia, Sarah now lives in Berks County and enjoys organic gardening. Very nice, Sarah. All right, and Diana. Diana Mayer is the Education Coordinator for Schuylkill River Greenways. She graduated from Boston University in 2019 with a BA in Environmental Analysis and Policy. Diana joined the team remotely in 2020 following the completion of her AmeriCorps term as a New Jersey Watershed Ambassador. She works closely with Education Director Sarah in order to expand SRG educational programming. Diana is passionate about educating and engaging students about the many different aspects of the environment. In her free time, she likes to paint and go on hikes with her dog. 
Thank you again, Sarah and Diana. Uh, we're so glad to be working with you and so excited for your presentation. So ladies, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jamie. We're so happy to be here tonight. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, Diana's gonna boot up her screen. So I hope you're all seeing our presentation, The Watershed and You, Understanding Your Impact on Our Water Bodies. Like Jamie mentioned, I'm the Education Director and we have Diana Mayer, who's our Education Coordinator. Schuylkill River Greenways is a national heritage area. Um, we are designated by the government for our specific cultural landscape. Um, the significant uh, piece of our history that is in Southeastern PA that um, helped us achieve our designation is the Schuylkill River um, because of its historical significance in the American Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, and the Environmental Revolution. Nowadays, we like to call um, it and a, a recreational revolution that we're experiencing. Um, we encourage residents and visitors to get outside and get connected to the Schuylkill River through different engagement um, tools like recreational events and um, fundraising events and just fun community events like movie nights and comedy shows along the Schuylkill River. That is our mission and we provide educational resources, events, and we have the beautiful Schuylkill River Trail that is our signature feature. It's the backbone of the Schuylkill River Trail, I mean the Schuylkill River, and our goal is to complete that trail that runs from Philadelphia County all the way up through Schuylkill County. We have many Programs and projects, as I mentioned, our number one project is the Schuylkill River Trail. Here you can see a picture of it on um, the right side of your screen. It runs through five counties and will be um, almost 130 miles long once fully completed. 75 miles are paved and crushed stone and they're open to the public. You can ride your bike, you can walk your dog, you can run. Uh, we have a Schuylkill River water trail that begins in Schuylkill Haven, and that's the river that we like to use for recreation. So we encourage kayakers and people who canoe to go out and visit the Schuylkill River. And we are um, working hard to improve landings along the Schuylkill to increase access for residents and visitors and the public to go and get on the Schuylkill River in your boat. Uh, one of our best or my favorite programs is the Restoration Fund. We have grants available to local organizations and local governments to implement projects that improve water quality. So we really love recreation. We really love, you know, getting people outside, but we also know it's super important to protect the water quality of the Schuylkill River itself. So you can check that out on schuylkillriver.org and um, apply for mini grants to get different projects going. Programs, we are, have a very robust education program that Diana and I run. We have our Schuylkill Explorers Youth Education Program where we um, teach youth <laughs> about watershed education. Uh, we work with students from kindergarten um, all the way up to 12th grade. And we uh, love to engage youth, whether it's a community group, a church group, a summer camp, um, we love to get them outside. You see the kids there in the stream, that's the Manitoni Creek in Pottstown, learning about macros, macrovertebrates, um, water quality, and just you know engaging with the outdoors. We also have our Schuylkill River um, Environmental Career Opportunities, which is a career development program uh, aimed at high school students in Philadelphia mainly, but this last winter, we went virtual and engaged students that were in high school and in college throughout the entire watershed and even um, in Delaware. We are having our 23rd annual Schuylkill River Sojourn, which is running this year in July. Usually it's the first week of June. This year it's a little bit different. We're starting on July 31st and running through August 4th. It'll begin at Jim Diedrich Park and end in Philadelphia. So it'll begin in Berks County and go through um, down the river all the way to Philly. Registration opens in May. We encourage you to join us if you'd like. You can sign up for one day or the whole week. And we have awesome pedal and paddle events where you bike up the trail and then paddle back down, back down the river and learn about the heritage area, the river and get um, you know refreshments or lunch along the way. So the first one that's upcoming is May 15th. May 15th, it's in Pottstown. June 17th, it'll be on the Perky Omen Creek. And then July 10th, it'll be Betswood to Norristown with um, Audubon as guest speakers. So that will be on the Schuylkill River down near Valley Forge. So 
So um, tonight's session is called uh, Watershed in Use. So we're going to talk a little bit about what watersheds are, um, where they are, and how we impact watersheds and our water bodies. So a watershed is uh, an area of land that drains into a common body of water. So what does that exactly mean? It means that precipitation flows, once it hits the ground, it flows from the highest point to the lowest point, which is usually um, a body of water. Some of that precipitation seeps into the ground and, inf and infiltrates the soil and uh, becomes groundwater. Uh, but most of it runs off the surface of the land and will eventually end up in a river, a stream, a lake, um, any water body. Um, so everything that we do on land affects the water that runs off because once it runs off, it can carry different things like pollution. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how that happens. So it can carry uh, pollution straight into our water bodies and affect the chemistry and um, how clean it is, the water quality. So um, if you live in this area shown on the map right here, then you live in the Schuylkill watershed, the Schuylkill River watershed. Uh, the Schuylkill River watershed spans 11 counties. It spans 2000 square miles. Um, and that makes it the biggest tributary to the Delaware River. Um, it also provides uh, drinking water to 2 million people. So we get our drinking water, the water that comes out of our faucets, um, that all comes from our surface waters. So that comes from the Schuylkill River itself. Um, and then it flows into the Delaware River, making it um, the most populated and largest tributary uh, to flow into the major river of the Delaware River. Now the Delaware River watershed is made up of different sub watersheds. The Schuylkill River watershed is a sub watershed and um, contributes to the uh, river. So the Delaware River watershed um, serves 13.3 million people. So it provides 13.3 uh, million people with that drinking water. Uh, it spans four states and 388 square miles. That should say square miles. Uh, no wait, 388,000 square miles. Um, and then it's also a habitat to 400 bird species and 90 fish species, some which are endangered. Um, it's very important for uh, local economies, uh, for uh, recreation, for water quality, for ecosystems, and for um, essential wildlife and habitat. So environmental scientists designate water pollution into two different categories. There's point source pollution, which comes from one source. It's easily managed, and those are the um, sources that are permitted and um, regulated by environmental um, organizations. So like the Department of Environmental Protection, um, it's a state agency or a um, federal agency that is watching these sources and making sure that they're not over polluting or polluting, um, you know, very toxic chemicals into our water. The second source of pollution is called non-point source. So you can't point to a specific source of this pollution. It comes from many different places and it's harder to control and mitigate. Um, and that's the one that is really the biggest threat to our watershed because, you know, there's no one regulating it. There's no one keeping a watchful eye um, and there's no really way to control it other than educating people who live in the watershed because it comes from um, the communities that live in the watershed. It comes from our actions. So some of our non-point source pollutants are litter. I'm sure you've all seen litter walking outside. Um, I know none of you litter. So when you see it, it is important it's cleaned up because that does end up in our drinking water waterways. Sediment and fertilizer. Um, many people have said, you know, well, soil is natural. How can that be an issue? It's when there's too much, right? When water and soil mix, it becomes mud and we don't want to drink mud. We don't want to have muddy waterways. Fish can't live in mud um, and plants can't thrive in mud. And fertilizer is a major, major issue from um, farms or when you fertilize your lawn. So, you know, it's important to use natural fertilizers, to use minimum amounts of fertilizer. And the number one rule is to not apply it before a big rain because then it's ultimately getting washed away immediately into our watershed. Animal waste is another issue, whether it's from cows and chickens and pigs on a farm or your dog when you walk your dog down the street and you don't pick up after um, your 
beloved pet. So it's important to take care of um, your neighborhoods, your surrounding areas, and farmers are getting more and more um, you know, just knowledgeable and con connected to environmental organizations to implement different best management practices on their farms um, that, you know, contain manure and decrease the amount of just fertilizers and pesticides and animal waste in our streams. Pesticides and herbicides are another major issue. Um, you know, a weed is just a flower that we might not want there. Dandelions are actually a native plant to this uh, region, to our state, and they are bees first food in the spring. So I'm sure you've seen many of them out there right now. I left my dandelions and maybe I'll rip them up when they go to seed, but I think that they're a good flower <laughs> and I like them there. I encourage you to kind of change your perspective on what has been deemed a weed or a pest um, in the past and kind of just know that everything kind of serves a purpose, right? And it's here for a reason. So be careful using them, you know, rip things out, use maybe cardboard as a weed barrier. There are many alternative methods to um, move away from pesticides and herbicides. And motor oil and gasoline, it's very important. You know, everything that you pour down the drain, even if it's a storm drain outside, is going to your local waterway, which is our drinking source. So it's, you know, just make sure you're disposing of that in a correct way and not making a mess with your motor oil and gasoline. And here's just an example. So as humans, we create unnatural landscapes because we like to live in buildings and houses and have built, um, offices and all of that, which is fine, but it's really important to maintain um, natural environments because if you see on the left side, the biggest thing is that when the rain falls on land, we want it to kind of soak in. The earth and acts as like a natural sponge and it soaks the water in and then it also actually cleans it. That's why um, many people have wells that are into the groundwater and it's naturally um, filtered and they can drink that water. Um, unlike city water where you know it goes through a, a plant and it's cleaned. Um, so it's important to make sure that we're not developing everything. When we go to develop places, we wanna make sure that you know, we're doing it minimally and it's really just important to, you know, keep your grasses, keep your landscapes, keep your forests because it's, um, it's our natural filter. It's important to keep us healthy. So storm drains are um, what they call a gray infrastructure. Um, it is meant to divert water from the street to prevent uh, flooding and any kind of damage to our, uh, our streets and our sidewalks. Um, but it can actually be harmful in its um, effects. So it's meant to direct um, water from the street to directly to a water body. But as you know, with watersheds, everything that the water is carrying will go into that water body. So you can see here on your right, this picture, um, this is what they call a separated system. So right here, you can see the catch basin. It is absorbing water that is coming from the street, coming from um, the park or the natural lands, and it will eventually go through the storm drain into the waterway directly. And you may have seen um, a storm drain looking like this. So all of everything that's on top of that grate, that water bottle, um, any oil that's mixed in, pesticides that are mixed in, it's all going straight into our water body without any kind of treatment. Um, for the separated one as well, there is a different uh, sanitary sewer and that's our household wastewater that goes directly into the sewer to a wastewater treatment plant and then it will be um, separated to the waterway. Um, in old cities, you may, there may be, um, a combined sewer outfall. And what that means is they uh, said, hey, let's put all of the storm water and all of the wastewater into one pipe and direct it straight to a treatment plant to treat it. You may think that's a good idea, but of course, with lots of rain and hurricanes, they um, built a, an outspout right here. So in the dry conditions, all of that waste will go directly to a treatment plant, which is great and it'll all be treated. But once that heavy rain comes down, it overflows and they had to build some kind of capacity to deal with that. So they built an outfall straight into the water body 
So all of that human waste and all of that uh, roadside pollution will go straight into the waterway. There are some cities that still have um, infrastructure like this, and that just means that there needs to be a major overhaul of the infrastructure um, to deal with that kind of pollution. So instead of gray infrastructure and the combined sewer outfalls, it's best to use uh, natural uh, green infrastructure. So plant more trees, uh, plant buffers around streams to prevent any kind of pollution and have that natural land to act as a filter and clean our water naturally. So um, we wanted to uh, part wanted you all to participate. Um, so I have this picture. This is from the EPA's website. And it's just showing a neighborhood of people going about their day. And um, there's a few things wrong with it, a few things that might hurt our water bodies. So in the chat, I want you to type up anything that you see that might be wrong with this picture and maybe some ways that we could change it. Dumping into the drain, the car leaking oil over here. Yep, that's all going straight into the storm drain that will directly flow into the water body. Litter, this guy over here, He's throwing his litter down. He's not putting it into the garbage can. That's another one. Pouring chemicals, yep. Oh, watering the sidewalk. So you see this sprinkler, it's going on to our um, concrete surfaces, which will run off into the water body. It's a good catch. A lot of people don't catch this one. So if you have a sprinkler, you don't wanna water your driveway. You wanna keep it on the natural grass. No riparian buffer, that's a good one. So over here, you can see that there's erosion happening and all that erosion will eventually flow into the river. So what would be needed here are some trees, some natural plant, native plants. So we have litter, the leaking car, dumping into the storm drain. We also have this woman right here who's planting um, some plants in her yard and she spilled all the fertilizer on the lawn. And we have the sprinkler and then the bagging of leaves. These leaves could be used um, for a natural compost or they could be used um, for uh, a natural fertilizer for gardening, anything like that, instead of just bagging it and throwing it to the dumpster. And no riparian buffer, so good job. So why should we care about our land and our water so much? Well, of course, rivers are the source of our drinking water. Uh, they provide millions, billions of people with uh, drinking water. Um, and also clean river, clean streams, clean lake. It boosts our local economy. It increases our real estate value. It um, decreases treatment cost of, and instead of making a huge billion, trillion dollar uh, treatment plant, we could use real trees and nature to um, infiltrate that water and clean out those pollutants. Um, it can increase recreational revenue. Of course, everybody wants to go uh, kayak and go fishing on the clean lakes. You definitely don't want to go in a polluted lake. Uh, the water quality is also a, ref a reflection of our actions on land. So we should be proud of where we live and we should be proud of um, the natural landscapes that we have. So we all kind of need a, to have a responsibility to take care of our community. And watershed health is vital for ecosystem health. It supports many different species, many different endangered species, and, um, and it, it, it supports plants, animals, and us. So here we have a back-to-back -back, uh, picture of an unhealthy stream. You can see there's a lot of uh, gray infrastructure, those roads, impervious surfaces. We also have um, livestock right along the river um, and with livestock uh, comes a lot of waste. Um, and then we also have all of this nitrogen and phosphorus, those nutrients that will end up polluting and deoxin and taking out the oxygen from our river to, um, and that would eventually kill off all of the vital, um, vital species that live in our river. And over here we have our healthy streams. So we don't need to keep our uh, environment exactly how we how we found it, where it's exactly 
with, with the trees and all of the natural land. We can build on our land, but we have to do it in a sustainable way. So over here we have our city and we have uh, trees and green infrastructure throughout it. We have a farm with uh, the livestock in one place and we're doing it responsibly. So we just have to rethink of how we go about life and how we go about development and uh, do everything responsibly. And how you can make a difference. I love that you said that, Diana. You know, being human is who we are and we using our earth is what we do. We live on this planet and we um, need to drink our water and go to the bathroom and walk our dogs. It's all about, you know, gaining a larger perspective and knowing how your actions impact our shared waters. So we're gonna talk about how you can make a difference. One of the best ways is to conserve water. I'm sure you've heard it plenty of times, but you can save money, reduce the water that needs treatment at the water plant. And it is a limited resource, right? We only have a certain amount of fresh water available to us. And we'll show you a slide on that. Um, but it's important to make sure you're not overusing your water and you're using it wisely in your home. You know, don't run it too long when you're washing dishes and just don't, just make sure you use it as um, responsibly. Here's our lovely picture of our fresh water. So um, happy Earth Week. <laughs> Here's our beautiful Earth and all of the water is kind of condensed so you can kind of get a better visual. That big blue dot is all of the water in our oceans, which I'm sure you all know is very salty water, right? That is not our surface water that we drink. The second one is the fresh water that we cannot get to. So this is the water that is in glaciers, that is underground, that we can't tap into. And then the third one, we're gonna zoom in a little bit more to see this one. That, that is the fresh water that is the surface water that is available to us or the groundwater that we can pump up and drink. So when you think about our earth and you're like, oh, there's so much water everywhere. Not all of it is accessible to us. Not all of it is drinkable for us. So it's really important that we do our best to keep our waters that are accessible, which are very minimal, um, clean and healthy for us and our children and future generations and other species on this planet, like Diana mentioned, plants, animals. Um, and the better we do, the you know better our environment will be that only continues to benefit us. Disposing of trash properly is probably one of the number one things, right? We don't want trash in our streams and trash does break down into different particles, um, different chemicals leach. So it's not just the actual trash itself, it's what it's um, you know, leaching into our water supply. So it's important to check what you can recycle. And I encourage you if you don't have recycling in your um, town or at your apartment building to kind of seek that out. I know that in my local borough, um, we have trash or recycling um, dumpsters that we can bring our recycling to if we don't have pickup at our house, which is really great. Uh, no wish cycling. So that's when you really wish you could recycle something, you know, you take your um, flimsy plastic off of your pack of toilet paper and you really wish you could recycle that plastic, but it isn't recyclable. It does more harm than good when you throw things that are not recyclable into the recycling bin. Um, make sure you clean them out right when you're done with that jar of peanut butter. I know it's like sticky and annoying, but if you just fill it up with water and let it sit a little bit, the water will break it down and then you can clean it out and throw it right in the recycling bin. Removing capsule and bottles can help so the air doesn't get trapped um, and no flimsy plastic like I mentioned before. So, you know, you can look up your local trash pickup, your recycling pickup. Um, there are many recycling guides online. Here's one right here. Um, and just make sure that what you're recycling is recyclable. You're doing better by recycling what you can than trying to recycle everything you wish you could. I guarantee it. So the best way to reduce um, plastic in our environment and harmful chemicals in our environment is to stop using them. Um, so you can use different alternatives to plastic instead of uh, reusable plastic water bottle, you can get a reusable metal one. Um, these ones will last a lifetime. Uh, instead of a toothbrush, a plastic toothbrush, you can get a bamboo one. I get my bamboo toothbrushes at like a, a local Marshalls or a TJ Maxx. They have uh, a few packs of them every time I go. So it's a really easy fix. It's the same thing as a plastic one. Also, um, another uh, plastic substitution is a bamboo scrubber for your dishes with bars of soap. So instead of buying a plastic jug of dish soap, you should get a bar of soap or um, a bar of dish soap. 
Also, there are things called microplastics. That is a really big issue uh, nowadays because they're just impossible to clean up and they come from a lot of different places. Microplastics are classified as plastics um, that are less than five millimeters big. That's for perspective, that's about the size of um, a pencil eraser or smaller. They can be very, very small, like the size of glitter. Glitter is a, a microplastic as well. Um, but the biggest source of microplastics are from synthetic fibers. So those things like yoga pants and those waterproof t-shirts that you might have, those are made from recycled plastic. And when you put them in the washer, the fibers will break down and it will flow directly into the pipes, will flow directly to the uh, wastewater treatment plant. And they do have filters there, but they don't have filters that are uh, small enough to catch those really tiny microplastics and then they will just flow straight into our water bodies into the ocean. Um, so instead of using synthetic fibers, maybe um, buy more cotton fabrics, more organic fiber fabrics, uh, you can always check what the product you're buying is made of and you can also um, use a laundry bag to catch if you have to use any synthetic fibers, they can catch all those that shed off so they don't go into our pipes, which is the best, um, the best way to prevent microplastics any further. Also, um, microplastics come from a big plastic waste that shreds off into uh, plastic chunks. So um, plastic that's flowing in the ocean will eventually degrade and degrade into smaller pieces. Also beauty products that have um, microbeads those are just small plastics that will wash directly into the drain once you're done using it. Um, so try to stay away from anything that says microbeads on it or like scrubbing fibers. So just um, research what you should buy instead of plastic, research what is uh, the best uh, thing to buy. And it's also really good to invest in what you're buying in. So instead of just going to Old Navy and buying three shirts that, are, that uh, will wear and tear within a year, it might be better to invest in the more expensive shirt that will last a lot longer. And for more information, you can look at this website. It's myplasticfreelife.com slash plasticfreeguide, which will give you a bunch more uh, different substitutes that you could implement in your own life. And of course, we said before, clean up after your pets if you have a dog. Um, they make those little holders for the plastic bags that you can just uh, tear off and pick up and throw it away. Um, pet waste has harmful bacteria in it and excessive nutrients that can run off into our water bodies and pollute them even further. They make um, very eco-friendly dog bags now. You can get big packs of them and um, you don't have to worry that much about your footprint. Also, um, planting native plants really helps our watershed. Um, grass is very inefficient. It's a very inefficient type of plant as it doesn't offer much of a habitat for a pollinator species. Um, it takes up trillions of gallons of water each year. It takes up a lot of like millions of gallons of pesticides as well and herbicides. Um, so the best way to um, add to our watershed is to create um, gardens, a rain garden, pollinator garden, vegetable garden, they're all good and will support our natural ecosystems. Native plants are the better choice instead of an ornamental uh, plant that you see at Lowe's or something. Um, they require less water. They don't need any fertilizers or pesticides. They'll grow on their own and they can support our species here, our local species. Uh, ornamental plants, they just can't do that. And non-native plants, they wouldn't add anything to our uh, environment. Um, so native plants, they uh, create habitats, they can filter out pollutants from stormwater, they can also absorb stormwater better than just grass, um, and they can prevent flooding as well. Um, this website right here, jerseyyards.org, um, it'll give you all different kinds of plants that you can implement in your yard if you're just getting started in gardening or you want to do more and want to plant your own rain garden or pollinator garden. It'll tell you everything you need to know, um, all different plant suggestions, plants that would support local pollinators, plants that would support 
butterflies if you want to see more butterflies. Um, so it's a really good website. Also, Hawk Mountain is having an outdoor native plant sale, native plant sale from March 15th to 16th. Um, I'm sure you can talk to Jamie about that even more after if you want to. Um, definitely go to that if you're looking to plant for the spring. I think the last slide was May, but we'll let Jamie clarify at the end for Hawk Mountain plant sale. Um, so I know first, before I get into this, I know it can all seem very overwhelming, right? There's so much plastic in my life and how can I make all these changes? And it's really just one step at a time. Um, you know, throughout the time that I've learned about these things, I've just changed my habits when I can. Um, you know, I still have plastic in my life. I still have plastic shampoo bottles and I still have a plastic bottle of Dawn on my sink to wash my dishes, but that's okay. You know, I'm doing what I can. I switched my lunch bags to stasher bags, which are silicone reusable plastic, not the, I don't know what silicone is plastic, but they're reusable bags. So I'm not using Ziploc bags over and over again for my lunch. Um, you know, you can switch to a water bottle. That's a really easy fix. It saves you money. Lots of things, like Diana said, can kind of be an upfront cost, which I know can be a barrier for some, um, but in the long run, it can save you money and you do what you can. If you can't do one thing, look at another place in your life where maybe you can make a switch. Um, we're all just doing our best. That's all. We're just inviting you to join this journey with us to um, a healthier watershed. Uh, one of the great things that you can do that doesn't require any money is volunteering with SRG. So we are a nonprofit organization. And as Jamie mentioned before, just like Hawk Mountain has members who fuel their work, we have members that fuel our work. We love our members and we encourage you to become a member if you're not already of Schuylkill River Greenways. You can learn more at schuylkillriver.org um, that has all of our great resources there. So we have volunteer opportunities for trail maintenance. As I said before, the Schuylkill River Trail is a large trail. Um, we can't do it. We can't maintain it without the help of you all who use it and love it just as much as we do. Um, we have our trail ambassadors who are avid trail users who are out there all the time and they connect with us and they help improve trail user experience. They help spread word about the trail. They help clean it up and just let us know, you know, if things are wrong, if they need fixing, if a tree is down. So um, if you're interested, if you use the trail a lot, I encourage you to become a trail ambassador. Um, feel free to email me, look online. I run that program and I'll be happy to set you up with your trail ambassador gear to get you going. All of our volunteer hours are also submitted to the federal and state governments that help us secure our funding annually. So um, your volunteer hours do really go very far, not just benefiting us immediately with our projects and programs, but also securing funding for our organization um, year after year. We have special event volunteers with the Sojourn coming up, um, our lovely ride for the river in the fall which is our bike ride on the Schuylkill River Trail. We always need event volunteers. If you would like to come and check people in or sort t-shirts or help give out snacks, there's always an opportunity for you. If you're not into, you know, trimming bushes and picking up trash, there is an opportunity for you, I promise. We have civic group volunteers and adopt a, adopt a trail program. So maybe if you're a 4-H group or maybe like a Girl Scout troop or a um, community group, we encourage you to reach out to us and connect if you're interested in like adopting a part of a trail or doing a team cleanup. You can learn all of, all of this and more at schoolgirlriver.org slash volunteer. We have a very robust, robust website and I encourage you to go check it out. Our community science opportunity that I want to pitch to you tonight that directly um, relates to water quality is our trash assessments. It couldn't be easier to do some community science while you're out on the Schuylkill River Trail or along the Schuylkill River. So um, step one is to go around the Schuylkill River. It doesn't have to be any particular spot. The river is, you know, expansive through many different counties. So wherever you live, if you go, if you fish, if you take walks, if you just like to go and look at the sunset or take pictures, um, if you're out there, I really encourage you to check, um, to go to this link, to check it out and just do a quick log of what you see. So if you go to your smartphone, open the internet and go to bit.ly slash litter form, you can use your location that's already on the map, it kind of geotags it automatically and we ask your permission to geotag it. You can upload a photo of your area and you can rate this 100 foot section. So kind of just like what you can see to the left and to the right of you. And it asks you questions of, you know, what level of trash are you seeing? You see here, we have this nice little visual, you know, is it like one piece of trash or is it like 50? 
So we have it ranging from optimal, which we would love to see, right? We would love to see like zero trash or maybe one piece to poor, which is tons of trash, right? And you're helping us um, pinpoint hotspots along the river. You're helping us understand the river more that we can't always see. Um, you're telling us about different illegal dumping that might be happen, happening or littering or oily sheens that you're seeing. So um, we encourage you to get out there. It's a great way to get involved. And we are um, really hoping to engage the public more on this and get you more um, interested in your water quality. Um, it's a five minute assessment. We would love for you to do like 10 a month, but you do what you can. If you go out to the river one day a month, I would love for you to do an assessment. So visit that link. I encourage you to check out schoolgirlriver.org. And if you have any questions at all, always feel free to reach out to us. And that's all. I see questions are already rolling in. So I encourage you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, go to our website. And of course, always reach out to me and Diana if you're interested. Sarah and Diana, thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation. I personally learned so much and I can't think of a better topic, um, you know, uh, that impacts the, the well-being of all living things in our ecosystem, including us. And what, what a great program to do on the week of Earth Day. So we do have a question that came in and um, let's see, here we go. Is the community science opportunity focused on the Schuylkill River or does it also include the tributaries? It's mainly focused on the Schuylkill River. Um, we are in partnership with a couple other uh, nonprofits in the area, Berks Nature in Reading, the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education in Maniunk in Philadelphia, and then um, Bartram's Garden, which is in Southwest Philly in Maniunk. Um, so we're focusing on the Schuylkill because we wanna see different trends along the Schuylkill in these different areas in the different counties. Um, so it's really focused on the Google. But if you see something on a tributary, you could always um, reach out to us or take a picture and send it to us and we can kind of make note of it. But that data collection is really the Google River. That's a good question. Wonderful, thank you. Well, I don't see any other questions right now. Um, here's a comment. Just uh, accolades to uh, Sarah and Diana. Thank you, great presentation. A lot of helpful, important information. Thank you, thank you. So good job, ladies. Um, and I see there is a raised hand and we just kind of asked you, you can either type in your question in the chat or in the Q and A. Don't be shy with questions. <laughs> All right, well, I think that, well, we'll wait to see if any more questions come in, but I think maybe I'll move forward. Oh wait, I think here, here comes one, let's see. Uh, Okay, here we go. I now don't weed or mow my lawn until early fall to allow the flowers there to be pollinated by bees, et cetera. Um, oh, I guess it's more of a comment. So did you have any comments about that, Sarah or Diana? It's yeah, no, you, you bring up a great point. So um, in the fall, if you wanna stop your screen share too, Diana, you can. So in the spring, the rule is kind of like leave your gardens until I think the nighttime temperature is above 55 and you're helping pollinators in that way because you're allowing them to kind of get their foot uh, going, get their footing before um, the real season begins, right? And then in the fall, the best that you can, I know that some people may live in, um, homeowners associations and have different rules, but the leave the leaves campaign, right? If you leave them be, they're natural fertilizers, like Diana said, they're homes for pollinators and other species and have um, that live in this area and uh, use it as habitat. That's a really good point. Yeah, and also what I love about it, of course it's good for the environment, but that means less yard work for me. So that sounds <laughs> great. I'm, I'm, definitely, I'm definitely a fan of that for sure. Um, yeah, and as was mentioned in the presentation, Hawk Mountain, we have so many wonderful volunteers at Hawk Mountain, as I'm sure SRG does as well. And we have some very dedicated uh, native uh, plant, native garden, native habitat volunteers, and they organize and grow all the plants that we sell at our native plant sale. We have it every spring and every fall. It's always the middle weekend in May and the middle weekend in September. So I believe that's May 15th and May 16th this year. And it's all, all outdoors all day. Um, okay, here we have another question. Um, New Jersey has legislation pending that will promote burning and logging from the highlands to the pinelands. 
Do you have any information on this? New Jersey Sierra Club and the Pinelands are fighting them. Uh, logging will remove the tree canopy. Um, sounds like kind of a politically sensitive issue. I, I personally haven't been not, have not been aware of that. I haven't either. I mean, um, New Jersey is always one of the forefront states. I think it's because they have um, the coast as well. They have a lot of natural environments. You know, they have pinelands, they have the coast, they have their Delaware River and other watersheds in their state. Um, I don't know about that. That's cool. And, um, you know, that's cool that you bring that up and that you're plugged in. I'll have to research that. But I know that they passed one of the um, I think most widespread plastic bans recently. Um, they're the first state to pass like the plastic bag ban. And that happened um, because every municipality kind of signed on slowly. So that was like from the, the ground up, every municipality or township kind of made ordinances. So when you see things like that, um, I think it's important to remember that it's it's a slow and steady pace. And usually a lot of backing is behind it. It's, you know, big changes like that happen from the ground up. Yeah, the band in the bag, there you go. <laughs> It'll take effect in the year, that's awesome. Well, yeah, thank you um, for that comment, Joanne. Thanks for spreading awareness. Um, I think that I, I don't see any more comments coming in. I think I will take this opportunity again to thank our wonderful presenters, um, Sarah and Diana, I learned so much. I love the Schuylkill River Trail and the Schuylkill River, yay. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, thank you to our audience for joining us today. Um, we really enjoy sharing this time with you virtually. Thank you for caring about the environment and our watershed. Um, and I'd like to just um, share some upcoming programs that we have um, at Hawk Mountain, if you're interested. So as you may know, it's spring migration. So every weekend throughout April and uh, May, we have lots of programs, many of them free, including live raptor programs. So come check it out. Um, we have... Um, is this tomorrow already, April 21st, we have a Bagels and Birds event at 9 a.m. And also tomorrow we have Homeschool Happenings, Herps Awaken, that's at 10 a.m. And um, Earth Day, Thursday, we have a lot going on. We have a Signs of Spring Walk um, in the morning, 8 a.m. Uh, on Thursday. Uh, we also have that walk again on the 29th. Um, at 8 a.m. So going back to Earth Day the 22nd, we have our, our virtual sanctuary story time, Forest Bright, Forest Night, that's at 11 a.m. We have an Earth Day celebration at 2 p.m. on site that involves meeting a feathered educator, a guided hike to North Lookout, and learning things that you can personally do, um, you know, to protect the planet. Um, we have yoga on the mountain this Saturday morning at 9 a.m. And um, then on April 29th, we have another Discovery Institute program, which is a rain barrel virtual workshop. And that's at seven o'clock PM. So thank you again, everyone for sharing time with us um, and have a wonderful evening. We hope to see you soon. Take care, bye for now. <laughs>